Hey guys, welcome to Tennis Pal Chronicles, the podcast to feed your passion for all things tennis and happy new year. We're in 2020. With me is my awesome co-host, Valerie Garcia. What's up, Philip? Happy new year, Valerie. Yes, we made it through another decade. It's amazing. What a decade of tennis we have experienced. I, I've only been in tennis for 10 years. So this is super exciting for me because this is kind of my 10 year mark. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. Welcome. And I, I feel so grateful that I entered into tennis in an era that was so strong, so powerful. Many people say is the greatest era of tennis. Have you heard that? Uh, I couldn't really find much uh, to argue with in that statement. Well, just because you have like the three greatest men's players ever, right? And the, the heights that they've achieved. And of course, Serena, your girl, has... a achieved incredible heights as well and i feel like the game is just insane now compared to how it was yeah it's pretty amazing i mean of course the 70s was like an amazing decade of for, tennis i would but, say for american tennis right i mean it really well exploded. which is yeah for us i mean for i us. guess as americans yeah. for, for what i know of tennis since i first learned of tennis the things that I always heard were were things like McEnroe and Agassi, which is actually more 80s. Pete Sampras, but I mean, so I guess we probably had like two decades, mm. kind of, yeah. right? I don't really know. I wasn't around and I wasn't watching, so I don't know the exact <laughs> decades, but um, I feel like there were some really good ones, but this is definitely as far as like just the sport going to a new levels right. and and the domination of the top 3 yeah. is ridiculous it's yeah. something like our no the sport will probably never see again and like no other sport has such domination right and just the fact that they pushed each other to how many grand slams it's just insane you know i mean yeah. and and it's so exciting to see what's going to happen nadal only one behind federer right now so that's really exciting and is joke- it are you excited I'm, I'm not excited. I'm actually scared. <laughs> I'm shaking in my Nikes. I'm like, it's very exciting, I'm sure, for Nadal fans. <laughs> but it does add that tension of sports because we just don't know what's going to happen, right? Yeah, it's true. It's Who's going to end up on top the greatest? And No, it, Djokovic. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people say Djokovic, no doubt about it, because I mean, he is so... I mean, probably win 10 more. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll have to see. And and yet you always say you never know. Well, you're right? right. You never know. So that's what might break his ankle tomorrow, and his foot he gets gangrene. His foot falls off, and he never <laughs> plays tennis again. Well, we hope not, for Tanya's sake. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. Oh man. But it's great. For I'm manifesting all- it out into the world. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't want that. I actually I don't want him to pass Roger's record. But he is one of my favorite players. Obviously, as a tennis fan. Yeah. To watch. I I want him to continue to be amazing. It, it's insane how good he is, especially knowing where he came from, his history, like Tanya shared in our last podcast. And if you haven't heard that, you really need to check out this wonderful story of all of the f- fans that do our fan favorite reports, sharing their passion and what that was all about. It was our holiday special. Check out last issue because uh, Tanya talks about basically kind of her war-torn country and, and how her passion for tennis was stunted by, of course, all the war and the effects, but also how it really elevated the country because of Djokovic and yeah. because of all the people who love what he was able to accomplish out of the rebels of war. So that's incredible. And and what he gives back. And like I thought was so cool about her report was how how he's so endearing to his fans. Yeah. Like the time and the energy that he puts in to like, Make them feel like they matter when he's interacting with them. Yeah, I mean, that's, he, he that's g- cool. He he came over to them and gave them a hug. I mean, yeah, my like gosh, that's cool. That's really cool. I'm sorry if yeah. like I don't necessarily need a Djokovic hug, <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> I mean, I can see how that is like super cool. Like, I I think that uh, he, what he has done with what he was given is is amazing. It really he is. is uh, He's so cool. And it wasn't so long ago that we were counting him out because he had gotten to that kind of third rank, third place in competition against Federer and Nadal, but he couldn't break through, couldn't break through. And then all of a sudden, I think it was 2010 and 2011, just insane 
consistency and broke all the records at the master's level. And wow, just incredible. He is so incredible. And it makes me think like, is there some player out there right now who's going to be the next dominant or like these, the last three dominant players we're going to see for a while. Mm. Like that's what has me so curious about the future. Like, is there going to be some person who's going to like figure it all out and put it all together and, and just be like the next one who's going to knock them all off their thrones or is it going to be them just riding into the sunset and then kind of more like how the WTA is minus Serena, uh, like it's just parody or whatever where everyone is a contender. Yeah. I do feel like the level is so high now that you can't take for granted first rounds. So even against these top three on the male side and of course on the women's side I just feel like the level is really high it wasn't it's not like you can just coast through the first two rounds and kind of work your way into a tournament I think it was Maria Sharapova who said this you just have to fight from day one and even though they are incredibly dominant the top three I would say they're still fighting hard in the first and second rounds, it's just not a walk in the park. I think the level at the top fifty is just like you got to fight. <laughs> I know? love how I love how PC you are. I'm thinking of how many times, maybe for Federer, yeah. <laughs> how many times I see Nadal and Djokovic just bageling the crap or like breadsticks <laughs> in their first and second round. It's like I don't even watch because I'm like it's going to be a 55 minute match. <laughs> If someone takes them like in the first set to a tie break before yeah. they're bagel the next set, it's like, wow, good job. Maybe if they're a big ser- server. I mean, there's certainly a lot of players. There's a lot of depth and there's a lot of players who can kind of like push it. And it does end up coming down to like that seventh game or uh, they'll end up getting broken or right. whatever. Um, and then it kind of the match gets away from them like they're competitive for a little while. But you're right. They, they are. They are getting better and pushing them more. I see your point, though. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that the level of these people gets to a place where they're really pushing the top three, but the top three can sustain that level for so much longer, and, of course, that's why they win. Yeah. Uh, So the difference in the level is not as far, I think, as it used to be, but it's just the ability to sustain that level for so long, which makes them champions, and just incredible. It's true. But I think like the majority of the tournaments are three setters. Yeah. Yeah. And we're burping. And we saw Djokovic and Federer lose three setters this last year and uh, drop out of tournaments. So, yeah, just to say there are chances, not like before where it was like there was absolutely no chance. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how it actually feels to play these guys. I know, right? (laughs) It's just like watching serves go by. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> making making shots go whizzing by you all all day. Well, and speaking of serves, it's been really exciting to see all of these tennis players on social media committing their aces to um, raising funds for Australia and in response to the terrible fires that are over there. Yeah. So that's really cool. I saw Maria Sharapova. She committed to uh, donating an amount of money. I think it was 25000 And then she tagged um, Nole and asked Novak if he would match her, and he did. And so he probably threw a million on top of her <laughs> twenty five thousand. <laughs> and really, I feel like the whole um, goodness of the tennis community was forced by Nick Kyrgios. Mm-hmm. Nick Kyrgios yeah. was the first guy to come out. For, well, of course, for his home country, but I mean, he was the first guy to come out and say, "Aren't we going to do something?" about this i mean how much is it going to take for you guys to put together an exhibition and and they did they responded to putting together an exhibition and i think that's great and i saw a tweet recently that says rafa federer and serena are all going to headline that exhibition so oh nice i saw the picture of them yeah but i didn't realize what it was i thought it was like a past thing it it, it probably was a past picture but oh got you but it was announcing that right i didn't read Right, and I, <laughs> and obviously Nick will be there and, and uh, Team Australia and all of that. So super good, good on tennis for stepping up and, and making a difference in the way that they can. 
Yeah. And good to see that they're pushing each other on social media to do good, too. I think that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that. But you know what I'm really excited about? Tell me. I want to hear what Rosie Casals has to say, because I heard you had a quite a fun phone interview. You know, I, I'm so blessed to have had a chance to talk with Rosie Casals about her tennis career. I just can't believe that this podcast allowed me to do that. Now, I do know Rosie, and I have talked to her many times, and we do work together, but I've really never kind of gone in depth talking about what her career is. And to be honest, I feel like she is an unsung hero in tennis, yeah. that she really is one of the most important figures in the history of tennis in the way that she impacted the game, changed women's tennis, of course. But her her own tennis history is phenomenal. I mean, yeah. the, the amount of trophies she has, grand slams, the amount of wins she has, over 500 in both singles and doubles. Mm -hmm. My goodness, <laughs> what a champion. Yeah. And yet, you know, not much is really said about her. Yeah. So I'm very proud to bring her to the forefront in this interview. And I really hope that people will tune in and listen because I feel like uh, she has a lot to say. I thought it was really interesting bringing her back to her childhood in San Francisco and talking about what that's like. Yeah, it was super. I thought it was really fascinating to hear. I didn't know much about her bio mm -hmm. and her upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really cool. I didn't know that she was like from the other side of the tracks and things like that. So uh, really cool stories to listen to. I yeah. mean, if you are a tennis fan at all, if you care about tennis at all, uh, you have to listen to this interview because it's so cool. I agree. Well, let's get right into it. Let's let Rosie tell it in her own words. Fantastic. So, without further ado, Grand Slam champion and tennis hero, Rosie Cassell. <sighs> so please welcome Rosie Casals. Hi, Rosie. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you so Happy much. Happy holidays. For Oh, happy holidays, exactly. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell us where you are uh, physically in the world today. Well, physically, I'm in Palm Desert, California. Great. And how long have you been out in Palm Desert? Well, uh, I moved here about 20 years ago from uh, the Bay Area, uh, Sausalito. lived there for 35 years, uh, obviously born and raised in San Francisco. So I left the cold for some desert warmth. Yeah, that sounds great. And perfect tennis weather out there, I'm assuming. Well, it is. I mean, we have uh, great weather most of the year. Uh, we're a little cool uh, during the winter, but, you know, we get into the 70s and we still wear our shorts, still play tennis, but in the evening it's cool. That's great. Well, I would love to take you back to San Francisco your parents immigrated from El Salvador. You were born in San Francisco. What was the tennis scene like when you were coming up as a child? Can you describe to us uh, what it was like in Northern Cal? Well, um, yeah, I started playing about uh, eight, eight and a half years, eight, uh, between eight and nine, I think. And uh, my dad played recreational tennis at uh, Golden Gate Park. And I used to bug him when I saw him getting dressed with his whites and taking the racket out of the old press. Um, you know, I would tell him, how oh, take me with you, take me with you. And finally, he started taking me with him, and I would uh, sit behind him and watch and uh, bug him to let me play. And, you know, eventually, you know, I borrowed his racket, and he told me to go hit against the wall. And that's kind of how I started. I went and hit against the wall, watched, and, you know, then you realize that, well, maybe, maybe, you know, we should try, um, you know, letting her play. And, uh, you know, it's something that happened so easily. And it was just, you know, great that, uh, yeah, that I was so lucky and fortunate to, to have uh, been introduced to tennis because I had no idea where it would lead me at that point. But, uh, you know, it was the amateur days in, in, in the late 50s, uh, early 60s. So, um, you know, my aspirations were obviously to, the, to be the best I could be being a junior and, uh, you know, playing all the junior tournaments. It was uh, uh, great, you know, as I um, uh, excelled and, and, and got better and better and better in my 
uh, categories, starting with the nine and under and, you know, winning some of those tournaments, saying, oh, wow, this is really a lot of fun. So uh, I was very competitive. Well, you must have been incredibly talented and and very gifted from an an early age. I mean, it must have just been kind of come easy to you, and you must have been kind of innate in tennis. Uh, Did did you play with brothers or or sisters at all? I don't know if you had. Well, no, I mean, I started, you know, Golden Gate Park is known for a lot of... uh, pretty good tennis players uh and so you know there were always a range of tennis players uh being you know public parks uh product you know you you get a range of the hackers that that that, you know um would play with you uh when you were starting because uh no one who was really good wants to play with a kid. So it was my dad and, right. and his buddies, and, <laughs> right. and, and then you, you'd you pick up some odds and ends. Uh, you know, uh, the park was the kind of place where, you know, somebody would come every single day and, you know, for, for three, four, five years, they want to play on the same court, play at the same time, and then all of a sudden they disappear. So you'd have to find other people, but... I mean, I was pretty lucky, you know, as I said, I learned very quickly, so I was able to keep the ball in play, and, um, you know, uh, at Golden Gate Park as a junior, you you got to play doubles, because you can't play singles, um, you know. Because you're kind of well, hogging yeah, up the court, well, is that I why? mean, uh, kids were not allowed really on the court, so, you know, it wasn't like the kind of thing now where people think about, well, how can we, you know, help the juniors and let them play at certain times, I mean, so you were not really allowed unless you played with an adult. So that was part of the deal, and we played with an adult. Interesting. So, yeah. And and I, I, I'm assuming that during that time, you're actually playing with an adult wood racket. Is that right? Uh, yeah, well, actually, you know, uh, uh, there, there was this guy. His name was Don Worley, and, and, you know, he started hitting with me, and he was, you know, uh, one of these old cronies would hang around and play, and then he, you know, got me a racket and cut it off, you know, about two or three inches, and, you know, he polished that up and shellacked it and everything, and that became my racket. You know, but in the beginning, you know, you, <laughs> oh, you, you go to Wall, uh, you know, Kmart or something to buy a little cheap seven dollar, eight dollar racket. So, yeah, so I was quite small and short and tiny. So, um, yeah, it was very helpful, and you know, really, um, it was great. It was great. That's incredible. And uh, from what I understand, by the age sixteen, you were actually the top junior in Northern California. Wow. How about them apples? <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there, there, there's just so many things that you try and remember way back when, but it's been so long. And, uh, you know, obviously, um, like I said, you know, for me, um, I, I really um, love playing tennis. It was a great way to kind of express myself. I was very shy And, you know, I came from the wrong side of the tracks. And when I first started playing, you know, I started playing with a group of gals in the Whiteman Cup where everybody, you know, dressed in whites and looked, you know, like they had lots of money. And, um, you know, trying to figure out, well, okay, you know, here I am uh, as part of this group. And, uh, you know, so uh, the good thing about it is I was able to beat them. And that was, you know, kind of a way that I could, um, you know, feel that, that, that I was equal to them because I didn't have, you know, the clothes, I didn't have the money. And, and, you know, you're always kind as, as a kid, you're conscious of all that, that, you know, you're coming from a different place. Yeah. That's incredible how sport became the great equalizer for you. I read it in an article in People Magazine that, uh, you had said, the other kids had nice tennis clothes, nice rackets, nice white shoes, and came in Cadillacs. That's right. And uh, we came in uh, Studebaker when it ran. If I didn't have to push it down the hill to start it up, or we had an <laughs> old BSA motorcycle that I would jump on and my dad would take me to the park. I mean, whatever mode of transportation I can get to the park, that was fine with me. It was just, you know, such a, um experience when you're looking at uh, the kids, you're going to other tournaments, you know, sometimes you go to a country club and they're signing for hamburger, cheeseburger, milkshakes, and you bring in your brown bag of, uh, you know, uh, sandwiches and stuff. So, it, it, you know, tennis was was an upscale elite um, uh, a sport, and, and it was uh, not something that, um, you know, we we were 
used to. And so, you know, it was uh, a, a real awakening to see how different things were. And uh, it was. Uh, you mentioned your father drive you. He, and he was I my. He was my that. my great uncle. I was brought up by my great, great aunt and uncle. Okay, wow. And so they must have really been supportive of your tennis, because probably just like today, parents really need to make it possible for you to go to all these tournaments and play and support you in that way. Well, of course, um, my dad especially, because he was the one that played tennis, and my uh, great aunt did not. She wasn't, you know, a sports uh, oriented, but he took me everywhere, and uh, so... You know, uh, as you mentioned, parents that dedicate themselves to helping uh, the kids, you know, they, they see it as, as as part of their duty. And, of course, my dad loved tennis, so it wasn't like it was a, a hardship, really. Um, so, you know, when we learned the ropes that these are the tournaments you play and, you know, we went all over. Sometimes the car made it, sometimes it didn't make it. But uh, we, we, we <laughs> caught rides, and, and we got to the tournament. Some, sometimes I didn't make it and got defaulted. Other times, you know, we were there <laughs> on time. So, you know, it, it, it's just, like I said, so many different things that uh, added to, to the excitement and, and, and sometimes embarrassment for kids because, you know, when you're young, yeah. you know, every, if you notice that things are different, then, then you know you're embarrassed, and and so um, yeah, it, it, it was difficult for me, I think, uh, in many ways because things were so different. But like I said, because of my tennis, um, I felt that that really was uh, something that you know put me in the same category as someone who had. So I had my tennis; they had you know, their clothes and money and whatever, so. <laughs> so tennis was really everything for you well, during that yeah. time. Well, yeah, I mean, it opened so many doors for me and opportunities, you know, and as I said, during that time, you, you're not really looking at that. You're looking at, uh, you know, learning to play and being excited to, to be on the court and, and, and being able to play tournaments and going to different uh, towns and cities and places when you're young. I mean, you know, because you, you, you're so used to, you live in your own neighborhood, you know, and all of a sudden you're going to the East Bay, you're going down to the peninsula, you're going, you know, across the bay. So, you know, it, it becomes exciting, something new, and you befriend the other kids, and all of a sudden you, you've got a whole different group of kids. I mean, you know, you go to school, yes, every single day, but they're not really your close, close friends. You start getting closer to uh you know, the kids you're playing tennis with. Yeah. And did the kids that you went to school with, did they know that you were playing tennis? Did they know that you were good? Um, no, uh, they did not. They didn't know um, basically what I was doing. No, they did not. Um, so I think that um, uh, some of the school teachers definitely knew that I was uh, uh, playing tennis and that, uh, you know, I, I, I was pretty good in, in regards to the, uh, you know, moving up on the ladders. I mean, I was having articles, and so that was all part of the uh, kind of fun that, that you know, you, you'd read your in the paper, you'd read about yourself, and somebody would mention, oh, right. I saw a picture wow. of you, I hear you want so-and-so, and you won that tournament, and, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it's kind of an exciting thing to um, be young and, 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 and to be recognized and realize that, you know, this is kind of what you really want to do, but, you know, again... That's, that's incredible. Yeah, so I was lucky. Well, I lucky and I think incredibly talented. At the age of seventeen, it says that you were ranked actually number eleven in all of the United States. Well, again, like I said, you know, it was uh, something that I worked to be the best I could be. You know, and I was very fortunate also to have had um, a lot of opportunities. You know, from my 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 parents. I mean, you know from uh, my great aunt and uh, uncle, really, that uh, took me everywhere and, you know, helped me with my tennis. And 
also point point at me in the right direction because if he, if he wouldn't introduce me to Tennyson, had I not bugged them enough because you know at first I I just wanted to go go to Golden Gate Park and and ride around in the carousel, and then, and then I realized right. what 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 is he playing? He's playing tennis. This is tennis, and then you know it it, it was great. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about your family structure and, and their journey from El Salvador? Well, because I wish I, I, I could tell I you a lot story. more, but I don't know very much other than I don't even know why they, they came to the United States. What was the reason? I have I've never been to San Salvador. Um, you know, I had my mother that, you know, uh, uh, I have two, uh, three, um, uh, yeah, three half-sisters. And, you know, um, I grew up with my uh, half-sister, Vicky, in addition to the other girls, but they live with the mother, and we live with our great aunt and uncle. And uh, I, I could not tell you why they came to the United States other than I think during that period of time in the 40s uh, when they came and probably even earlier, um, there was a lot of uh, unrest in, 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 in the country. Uh, so with the government and, you know, the factions of, of, um, of, uh, dictatorship and what have you, know, whatever was going on there. So, uh, they chose to come here and obviously they were able to do so. So, you know, again, I wish I would ask my parents and my grandparents and my great aunt and, un- aunt and uncle why, uh, they chose to come to America, uh, especially during a time where, Things were tough because I, I believe they came during the Depression as well. So, you know, oh, wow. it was uh, uh, totally, totally, uh, yeah. <laughs> and and being young and, I, and got... not, you know, not really caring to know. You know, as you get older, then you, you care, care to know about all those things. Right. Well, I've got to imagine that your biological parents sent you to America hoping for a better life for you sent me to America, but I was born in San Francisco. <laughs> I was born and raised oh, in San I, I mean, Francisco. So gotcha, they didn't gotcha. send me, Sorry. but they sent themselves, and I believe it was for a better life, obviously, so that they could yeah. uh, do, do better. Um, but, um, you know, as, as, as I grew older and, 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 and you know, uh, started uh, doing better and, and wanting to compete uh, also with with the open women and stuff and did and, you know, realized that there were so many opportunities here for me uh, to grow and to move on because as you played uh, some of the older tournaments, some of the women's tournaments, you realize, you know, you're, you're meeting um, I- I- international players as well. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it, it, all of it started opening up uh, as I, I got older, obviously. I've got to think you had just a tremendous natural talent to learn to play tennis from a very young age. But did you have coaching uh, when you were young? Well, my from, dad was really know, my main. 17? My 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 my. I call him dad. Okay, so uh, yeah. even though he's my great uh, uncle, uh, he, he's the one really that taught me everything. And and from that, you know, you you, you watch. We had a lot of good players at Golden Gate Park that played in the men's opens, and you know, Tom Brown. I think is a name from. Way back when, uh, Jack Frost, uh, um, Whitney Reed. Uh, so, so there were a lot of good players, and we had a lot of good juniors as well. And so we all congregated there after school, and we would play and giggle. Sometimes we were serious, sometimes we were not. It didn't matter whether it rained or shine. Um, you know, we 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 just wanted to be there, and um, you know, it was like uh, very recreational. Thanks for sharing your family history. That is so interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I wish I knew more. I, I, I really do. But I think it was the sign of the times down there that things were not going well. And uh, obviously there was family here from, from you know, from San Salvador that they reached out to. So uh, I think that was really the biggest reason why why they were able to come to the United States and make a home here. I know you have a very strong partnership with Cal State LA. So at 17, when you're 11 in the world, 
did you go to Cal State LA or what? No, tell us I about your relationship. No, I never went to Cal State. Then. My uh, relationship there was strictly because of Billy Jean and King, and friends that we started a scholarship program for the tennis and the athletic department, and it happened quite, you know, um, uh, accidentally because uh, Billy Jean went there um, uh, during her college years, and she met her. Um, you know, husband there, her former husband, Larry King right. there, who played on the team. And, right. and, and, you know, he kept on saying, well, you should be on the team. You should be number one. You're better. He had a scholarship and she did not. And so, you know, how it evolved, the coach there, Tina Kowarski, had asked and said, well, how can we, you know, build the tennis program here? And it all uh, ended up uh, becoming an event called the Billie Jean King and Friends event, and I um, helped um, put it on and organize it through my company, Sportswoman. Yeah, that's great. And also you do that wonderful gala dinner at the Langham right. Hotel. Exactly. Uh, that was the is... fundraiser. Um, that was the fundraiser that uh, raised the money for the scholarships for the uh, athletic department as well as the women's tennis team. Great. So going back to being ranked number 11 at your 17 years old, so you just went straight into tennis then. You just started playing somewhat professionally. Correct. Correct. I started, obviously, there there wasn't such thing as professional tennis, obviously. That yeah. did not come into until 1968, even though we signed with uh, the National Tennis League. It was George McCall, who had Poncho Gonzalez, Labor, Roosevelt, and all those players, and he signed four women, which were Billie Jean, myself, Frankie Durr, and Ann Jones. And Althea Gibson played on occasions on, on that event, uh, um, on that tour. And uh, so we, we were contracted pros and got paid. And so that was 1967-ish. And then 1968, uh, Wimbledon was the first Grand Slam to... Uh, uh, accept uh, professional tennis and open tennis. And from that point on, things changed. And really, the tour, um, it became, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, an accepted thing in the, in the 1970s. Prize well, you, money and you and must have had a, Sure. And you must have had a meteoric rise because in 1970, you were ranked number three in the world. Yes, I was. Yeah, it, um, you know. So you, you um, must have won a lot of matches well, <laughs> in I, those three I, years. I won a lot of matches. I played a lot of tournaments. So, you know, being young and everything was new. Uh, my first year that I went to, um, uh, left the country and went to England uh, was in 1966. And I played with Billie Jean, um, you know, our first Wimbledon. So that was the first big trip ever for me and the first time really to play a grand slam and you know be in an international arena like that so it was, it was like so that major. was your first trip out of the united states as well correct correct wow yeah, yeah wow. that's and what i said tennis. yeah it was very <laughs> like i said when you're young everything is new and very exciting and um you know uh seeing what was out there different uh um you know surfaces, different players, different styles. Um, they were a lot older. So it was all a, 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 you know, exciting time for me finally getting out of school and, you know, saying, Oh my God, I don't have to go to school. Hooray. <laughs> As you can tell, school was not my favorite. <laughs> well, and of course there is the historic uh, partnership of you and Billie Jean King. You guys, won uh, seven uh, Grand Slam tournaments, I believe, as, as doubles partners. Uh, can you describe to us the, <clears throat> the day that you met Billie Jean King? I believe it was at the Berkeley Tennis Club in 1964. Is that right? Uh, yes. I played doubles against she, uh, Gloria Segerquist, my friend. We played in the juniors throughout the years. And we played Carol Codwell at that time and became Gravener and Billie Jean there at Berkeley Tennis Club for, at the Pacific Coast Tournament. And that's when all the tournaments after Forest Hills and, you know, the Pacific Southwest, and then they would come to 
Berkeley Tennis Club, and that would be the end of the summer circuit, and, that were, and, and, and the Australians were all going back to Australia, and everybody was going to where they came from. So, um, you know, when we were going to play them in the first round, I was like, oh, my God, so we're playing. And I remember seeing her, and we have a great picture of Billie Jean and Carol and myself and Gloria. They've got their Fred Perry with their monograms and initials and, you know, and, and, and all the rackets because then you didn't have racket covers. So, you know, you had to carry your four or five, six rackets. And here we were with our two little rackets and, you know, looking pretty sheep just <laughs> about, you know. But we played we played pretty well. We we competed well and, and, and pushed them, <laughs> pushed them to, to, you know, to play. I, it was something like six, four, seven, five. So, and I remember her making comment, wow, you're, you're pretty good. And, you know, I'm sure I'll be seeing, you know, plenty of you. And I said, I hope so. And, you know, maybe, a, maybe a year later or two years later, we met at the, uh, I think, I want to say it was the state or the central down in uh, Menlo Park or somewhere there, uh, where I played her in the finals and lost to her in that following year she said let's play doubles because i'm losing my um my partner karen sussman uh karen hans sussman whom they had already won to wimbledon at that point and she said well you know she got married and she wants to start a family and you know i thought whoa so what a what a chance here and i of course you know uh i was pretty cocky so uh i didn't think anything (laughs) of it that i would not be able to hold my side of it but uh you know, I learned a lot from her, and she was a good mentor in the former years of our partnership and life. Sure, and you definitely rose to the occasion by winning seven Grand Slam titles, and I think uh, you also had seven uh, finals together as well, in addition to the seven that you won. Yeah, the good old years. They were a lot of fun, what can I say? They, they were very much fun, and, um, you know, uh, again, when you're young, you have a lot of expectations, and everything's new and fresh, and you have a lot of enthusiasm. So they were great years, you know, uh, starting uh, and, and to realize that, that uh, you could compete on that level. That that was very special. Well, yeah. I mean, you were the best in the world during that time. That's that's something. <laughs> yeah, well, that that is something. I, I I don't know that you necessarily look at it that way, but you know, certainly, um, you know, it was uh, like I said, something that you aspire to, and 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 you know, your career is going up. So you know, it's kind of exciting when you see that uh, you're you're better, and and then you're competing, and 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 you know, you're maturing. Yeah. Well, I'm just. You know, I just want people to know how successful you are. You were the one of the most successful doubles players in history. You had 112 professional doubles titles. You're the second highest woman of all time, except Martina <laughs> Navratilova. So, I mean, that is incredibly impressive, and I, I think doesn't get enough credit. Well, thank you. But uh, you know, like I said, it, it, it was an exciting time, and uh, you know. Obviously, the, the the tennis world was a little bit smaller, but um, you know the players were tough, and uh, you know it was really a a a a great time. You know, so yeah, um, I'm proud of what I've done, without a Absolutely. doubt. Absolutely. Well, in in singles, you rose to the world number three, which is again staggering in itself. And you lost two singles titles, but you, you were in the finals at the U.S. Open. What, what was it about the U.S. Open that you loved that allowed you to play your best? I I, I really liked Forest Hills as a very young. Um, I think I must have been about maybe fifteen years old that I first played Forest Hills, and I saw it. It was you know a a, a great ambiance, and. Um, I felt very comfortable there. It was on grass, and it was a good surface for me uh, because we were basically serving volleys. So, um, you know, it was uh, just very comfortable and good atmosphere, and I believe I performed the best there for what 
ever reason, but I think the grass really suited my game more than anything. Grass there, and of course, grass Wimbledon is where you've done incredibly well. Um, and I think in 1970, you lost to Margaret Court. Um, do you have any memories of that match? I do. I know we went three sets, and boy, yeah, you know, she was tough. Uh, she had arms that were so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like at the net, she right? Get, yeah, <laughs> she I mean, you know, she was hard to pass, and uh, um, you know, she was a tough one for me to beat. And but, you know, anything could happen in the finals. I'm just sorry that that I wasn't able to win at least one Grand Slam in singles, and that was the closest, probably, that that I got to you know winning and. Uh, yeah, what what can I say? <laughs> yeah, I wish it could have been different, but it was not. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember how you felt on that day? Because that was, I guess, your first uh, final Grand Slam as you're heading towards the court and preparing for the match. Well, I mean, you know, it's hard to go back that far. I mean, of course, I, 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 for certain, I, I, I would be very nervous uh, being yeah. my first. And, you know, you try and, 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 and go through rehearsal as to what you think are, you're going to do. I mean, obviously, I had played, I had played uh, um, Margaret several times, so it wasn't like I, I, I did not know uh, what... Right, you knew her game. Yeah, and, and what to expect. Uh, so... So I, I I knew I knew that that I needed to um, play well, <laughs> serve well, and and uh, ho- hopefully be be able to return well. Uh, you know I, I I knew that that I was playing someone who's who, who's at that point I I think she'd already won at least ten Grand Slams. So right. um, you know I, I was playing someone who who was very very well experienced. And so it, it, it was not something that uh, um, <laughs> I was going to take lightly. And I knew that I, I, I really had to play well. I mean, she was someone who was the top. Uh, I don't know whether she was. I think she was seated number one. Um, Probably. So, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I, I just knew that, that, that I had to play well. I had to play well. And, and so, um, you know, all, all of those things. Um, you know, you're thinking, but you're trying to organize your thoughts uh, so they fit in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, I I know that, that I played as well as I could, and, and she was just better. And I, I, I'm sorry she was at that day because, um, <laughs> you know, I, I just remember her, um, you know, giving me a, a tough time and like I said, I knew that I had to play my best, and she played better than me, and what that's the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, to lose to the, the woman who has won the most Grand Slams in, in all of history, I think, is is no shame at all. No, no. I mean, you know, I, I, I know that I felt good about having gotten to, um, you know, the, the finals, final, and sure. it was a good uh, result, so... Um, I was happy. I was happy. Yeah. And obviously it shows what an in- incredible competitor you are. And uh, people have said that throughout your whole career, how uh, your fighting spirit, your your competitiveness. What do you uh, attest to that? How Where did that come from? Well, I mean, I'm sure it has to do with my background and growing up and fighting for things. I mean, you know, we played in the streets, you had to fight, you know, uh, it, it was something that <laughs> right. was innate to me. Um, you know, it, uh, you don't get things for nothing. So you, you get all the tough and, 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 you know, that, that, uh, part of, uh, your makeup is, is to fight and to be aggressive. And, you know, um, all of those things attributed, fortunately, to not wanting to give up always wanting to fight, always believing that you could win. And, and uh, you know, that that's how you perform. That's how you put, you know, y- y- you want to be successful. And, and it's, uh, I think these are innate things that happen to people that are successful. They, they, they're very confident. 
uh, about their abilities, and if they don't know something, they'll say, well, I'll learn. I'll learn. Sometimes yes, and sometimes you you don't, you know. And yeah. uh, But I think my background and where I came from and how I grew up, um, you know, uh, the, uh, it was tough knocks and, and stuff, but uh, um, I always felt I could do it. Yeah, made you hard as steel, huh? Yeah. And do yeah. you feel like it's something that you could teach? Is it something? No. Because uh, a lot of people talk about, you know, how American kids are, are not progressing as far as they could, and they don't have that fighting spirit, or they're not trying as hard. I don't know if you've heard those kind of comments before. Yes. Um, no. I, I, I really don't think, it, 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 I don't think that is something you can learn. No, I believe that is something innate, something inherent, that you're born with it, and that um, hopefully you'll learn to m- manage it. And so I don't think it's something you could teach, you know, because as much as I may want to teach somebody or coach somebody and tell them, you know, fight, don't give up, stay strong, you know, I don't think that's teachable. I yeah. can have, oh, I, I can tell them, I, uh, I can certainly tell them, but that doesn't mean that they can do it, you know, because yeah. um, uh, it, it's just part of you, and 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 I think that you know everybody's different, and some people that's too tough, and they will, you know, they'll roll over or they feel. I've done the best I can, and I can't try any harder. And that may not be my best or my har- trying hardest, but it's theirs. And so I have to accept that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's innate. Something's either there or not there. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people have uh, different thoughts on that and in trying to help raise athletes. So it's really interesting to hear from someone who's been there, done that, to get your opinion on that. I, I love hearing that. Well, that's the way it goes. And so that's what makes different people, different players, you know, different attitudes. And, uh Yeah. Well, speaking of different attitudes, yeah, we'll get to some fun stuff. You you got to play doubles with Ely Nastasi, and I think what a character, what an attitude! And you guys actually won two major championships at Wimbledon together in mixed doubles as well. What was it like playing with him? Well, psychedelic. Let me tell you, he was a character, <laughs> personality with craziness, absolute wildness with brilliance of tennis. I mean, he really was a very talented. <laughs> talented player but you know mentally he could go off at a moment's notice and you know if he got passed by the woman oh my god he would go after her and you know he just would not let it go and of course you know he loved to argue with the lines people and then you know at first it would start as something that was a joke but it would you know hopefully you know you 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 hope that you could finish the match without him going or getting defaulted or getting penalized you know now i don't think he would survive because you know with with um uh, the replay and stuff <laughs> he 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 would be absolutely <laughs> lost yeah he would be right. absolutely lost so um right. and probably you know. destroyed in social media too oh, i mean well you know uh, yeah i mean definitely a character uh, you know, a, a, a wonderful person, really a very likable person, a lot of fun uh, and caring. But when he was on the court, he was totally a different person and he was not manageable. But, um, you know, <laughs> we got along just beautifully. And, um, you know, I, I think I was able to handle him and he was able, you know, he respected my tennis, he respected me. And I think that's why we got along so well. That's so great. So do you miss it? Do you miss the wild side of tennis? I mean, obviously well, there's McEnroe and Ely Nastassi, <laughs> and, uh, and, and you were pretty wild yourself. You are a rebel. I was a rebel, no doubt about that. I had my, my arguments and my fights and all that on and off the court. And, you know, if I believe strongly in things, but I think I was more rational than McEnroe, more <laughs> rational than 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 an Ely Nastasi, um, or, or or a Tyriac or any or a Bob oh, Hewitt gosh, or things, yeah. of, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, you know, I, uh, 
you know, you you get angry at things. Sometimes you go beyond and, but but I think I was rational. I mean, I I don't think I, you know, uh, once in a while, maybe once in a great while, my my anger got the best of me. But most of the times, not. You know, I I think I was able to. I I, I think I fought for the things that were worth fighting that that I believed in, and uh, yeah. you know that was um, you know. Uh, women's equality and equal pay and, you know, fight for, for, for the right to play and get the prize money and you have a place, uh, a, a, a tour to play, all, all of that, you know, the original nine and in, in, in the seventies, uh, breaking away from the establishment and, and, you know, um, you know, fighting for what they believed that w- was right. And, and I think had we not done that, uh, at that point and the original nine, not taking the position they did, fighting, you know, Jack Kramer and the Pacific Southwest and all the promoters that wouldn't give women, uh, you know, somewhat of equal prize money, if not equal prize money, something better than the 10 to 1 ratio they had. So, you know, all of these things that we worked toward in um, establishing uh, the Women's Tennis Association, the tour, uh, and and fighting for what we believe in making tennis what it is today. For, for women, I mean, oh my yeah, gosh. I, I really don't you know. feel like you get enough credit for that. I I know that you no, all you I, say I that you're one of the. I don't, I don't think we the, do. Yeah, I don't think yeah, we do. I know uh, that you say that you're one of the original nine, but in this way, tennis revolutionized culture because it was not just about sport any longer. It was really about equality. Correct. And with the, you know the first Virginia Slims tournament that you guys played in September of 1970, you you radically changed the structure of the political system in tennis, which is incredible Correct. that you did that. Correct. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I think we had a little bit of a head start by becoming uh, contract pros and defying what was out there because at that time, um, you know, they didn't look upon us as some, uh, as a positive uh, influence in, in, in women's tennis. I mean, you know, Margaret Court made comments of you're prostituting yourself for money. Well, she did the same thing because she, she wanted money as well. And uh, yeah. we just stated that we were pros, we're getting paid, and, you know, uh, they try to keep us out of, the, you know, being able to play the Grand Slam. But fortunately, in, you know, the, in 1968, they eventually opened it up to all the pros and uh, realized that that we were right, that what we were doing was the right thing. So, I uh, you know I I, I think uh, uh, I feel proud of, of of what I did and and the part the role that I played. In addition to Billie Jean being our leader and everybody that uh, um, you know took the risk for women's tennis uh, to be what it is today. Yeah, and not only did you make a stand and make a difference in the world, you actually won that first Virginia Slims tournament. So that must have felt really great. That that did, you know. I I felt that uh, uh, what we did there made a statement, was a beginning for good things to happen to women's tennis, and they did. And so, um, you know, it's nice to know that you were right, and I think... Uh, we made the right decisions because obviously, yeah, uh, look at where women's tennis is today. I mean, out of Absolutely. all uh, uh, sports, on your side. they're really equal. Yeah. I mean, you don't have soccer. The women win. They win the World Cups and everything, and they're still fighting for equality, and they still haven't gotten it. You, you got the WNBA again. They're under the jurisdiction of the NBA, and they're still fighting for equal prize men compared to what the men get. So, I mean, you know, everybody that was a part of that and that generation has to give one and give give themselves a pat in the back because um, you know if it wasn't for them uh, we would not be here with women's tennis um, sure you know yeah I think that is so true uh, you look at the Forbes list of women's sports athletes and the people who are making the most money and it's all tennis players and I really think it's thanks to you and thanks to the original nine and Billie Jean King. And you guys set that precedence for people like Serena and Maria Sharapova and Lee Na to make the kind of money that they do. And uh, I think people forget that. Correct. Correct. Well, uh, everybody called you Rosebud on the tour. So I wanted to know why they call you Rosebud. Well, you know, I you know, I want to say that, that uh, it could have been Roy Emerson that called me Bud, Rosebud. 
and then uh, uh, Bud Collins was uh, someone that, as you remember, he was very colorful with everything, his outfits. And yeah, his the famous uh, stories announcer and for exactly. tennis. Exactly. So he he began calling me, I think, uh, Rosebud, and sort of stuck, you know, between Emerson and he, and so it 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 became Rosebud. So yes. Uh, was it something that you ever wore, or it just came out of... No, it was just rosebud. No, <laughs> it, it wasn't anything that I wore. No, not at all. It's just that's what it became. You know, I don't know why nicknames, nicknames happen, but they happen sometimes <laughs> for a reason. How did you feel about it when they first... How did you feel about it when they first started calling you that? I felt fine. I mean, I felt it was something that, you know, was was uh, perfectly fine. I liked it. I liked it. Name Rosebud, so um, I was. That's born. great. Yeah. And uh, Billie Jean King is on record saying that uh, they called you the your peers called you General uh, <laughs> among the tennis yeah, players. Yeah, because I'm a why bit of a dict- Yeah, because I'm a bit of a dictator. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> how that's how I was. I was the general. I am the general still. So um, yeah, that's another nickname. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I want to talk a little bit about your foundation that you're involved in because I think what you're doing is such important work out there in the desert for tennis and uh, raising funds for juniors. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Love and Love Tennis Foundation? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, Tori, uh, 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 Tori Fritz played uh, WTA tournaments, too, during the Virginia Slims. And so we, you know, her living in Palm Desert as well, in the desert here, we decided that we wanted to do something for the kids give something back, you know, to the to to a, a, a game that, you know, really made our lives uh, a, a difference. Uh, so, you know, we decided we would start in 2015 the uh, Love and Love Tennis Foundation and hence um, been busy uh, trying to spread the word, you know, spread the game to all the juniors. So we've uh, worked hard to try and uh, give free tennis clinics throughout the Coachella Valley. We've worked uh, a lot with the Boys and Girls uh, Club throughout and uh, some of the uh, uh, school programs at the Coachella Valley um, Unified School District and the ACES programs. Um, we work with the National Junior Tennis and Learning um, League. And, uh, you know, my idea is to see how many kids we can get involved. I mean, most of the kids here play a lot of soccer, especially in the East Valley. And they don't have the opportunity, even though we've got courts all over the place, but they're in gated communities. There aren't enough public facilities uh, for kids, especially in the East Valley, the north part in, in uh, you know, Desert Hot Springs. And uh, so, you know, I've been busy uh, trying to figure ways in which we could spread uh, the game and introduce as many kids as we can. Uh, we give grants to existing grassroots tennis programs and academies, uh, you know, and they strictly go to juniors and developing uh, junior tennis. So we feel, you know, we're making a difference, making an impact and an influence, and I want to continue that. And uh, I've had a lot of great friends help, um, you know, uh, donations. Um, Billie Jean is one of them who's been super-duper and helping, and Martina and Chris as well. Um, you know, we have a fundraiser. Uh, the Love and Love Tennis Foundation um, is uh, presenting, is hosting the Annalie Thurston uh, Award reception, and Billie Jean King will be the recipient of that award this year. Um, we also have a local uh, talent, L- Lydia Rodriguez from the Coachella Valley High School, and we'll be honoring her with the Vicki Burner um, Heart and Spirit Award for her efforts, and we'll also be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the original nine. So we've got a lot of stuff coming up in March. (laughs) Yeah, that all happens at Indian Wells, isn't that right? Yeah, that's uh, during the BNP, Pariba Open. So, um, yeah, we'll have our dinner on uh, March uh, 15th, Sunday, and I also have another fundraiser called the Rosie Gazelle's uh, uh, Team Tennis Prime, and uh, we have... uh, uh, local award, the Jackie Cooper Award for a local um, tennis professional or uh, someone who's really uh, um, dedicated their themselves to promoting 
junior tennis. So that'll be um, April 19th here at Indian Ridge Country Club where I live. I don't think people understand how important and how big that Indian Wells event that you do for Anna Thurston Banquet. It's pretty amazing because it's a who's who's of, of, of tennis. I mean, Chris Everett was there laughing and talking about how her and Martina uh, used to play uh, was it backgammon before they would enter the finals together? <laughs> that oh, yeah. was an incredible they would play story. Backgammon, we would play boggle, we would play dominoes, we would play everything in the locker room. Everything surrounded, you know, everything was about the locker room. <laughs> That's so, <laughs> and, so, and, and, so incredible. And, and we that... would say, well, hold on, we got to finish the game before you go on court. So it was really funny because. Uh, yeah, there and was And then you go so out there more. and they're your warriors. Yeah, yeah. just fighting. Uh, I mean, there was the so court. much more camaraderie and friendship and and it still continues which is the wonder thing wonderful thing about our generation is that um you know, we're still friends, we still care about one another and what's going on. So, you know, it, it it's great that that uh we still can share some great moments together for sure. Well, this is something that our listeners really need to attend and, and support because, I mean, Billie Jean King is there, Martina Navratilova is there, Todd Martin was there, uh, obviously Chris Everett we just talked about. Yeah, and it's Tra- a Tracy who's Austin, who's of, Tracy Austin, yeah. I mean, Tracy we, Austin was there. Uh, yes, so, so, so many, many neat, people. Yeah, just, so it, many it's an, It was an incredible, and thank you so much for allowing me to be there to film. It was just a who's who of everyone important in tennis. And, and you gave away that signed Roger Federer racket, which was just incredible. Yeah. So I just want to encourage everyone to go to Love and Love Tennis Foundation to the website and, and support this event. You, it's going to blow your mind how in- incredible this event is. And Rosie, you you forget because they're all your friends, but I walk in there and it's star-studded. My eyes are just <laughs> as wide well, as I'm the earth. I'm glad you, you feel know? that way. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way because, you know, it is. I feel the same way when I walk in that room and I see such wonderful, um, you know, group of of, of uh, uh, tennis legends um, that come to the event and support it. Um, it, it it's wonderful. And, and they're not just legends, but they're my friends, so it's, it's they, even better. And they're better. your friends, and they, they <laughs> love you. Better. I mean, they... They poured so much better. love on you, and it was so fun to yeah. see them uh, shower you with love. And I know it's hard for you to hear because you, you don't like it, but, boy, it, it's, it's so great how much well, they love you. it's better than them hating me, you. so <laughs> I like it much better. <laughs> <laughs> I like it much better. <laughs> All right. Rosie, I want to okay. end with this. Uh, uh, please tell us, what was, uh, I mean, so many wins in your career. What was the best win of your career? What moment meant the most to you? Well, I think I would have to say my first Wimbledon. Um, winning the first uh, uh, Wimbledon with Billie Jean, uh, 1967, um, you know, first Grand Slam, uh, I think that was pretty thrilling. And uh, it, it, it will always stay in my mind, you know, because I know it was something so new to walk onto that center court, which is just beautiful. And... I've been back a, a couple times, you know, since, <laughs> and and it it never gets old to see um, that center court. It, it it is so special to see that center court, and then to have been a, a, a part of that, uh, you know, to have won, and um, you know, with someone like Billie Jean who had already won before. Uh, uh, so many times, uh, it, it, it was very, very special. Very, very special. It, it must have been special for Billie Jean King to see you win for the first time, too. She must have been so happy for you. Well, she was. She was very happy that um, it happened, <laughs> you know. The second yeah, of year, course we, to win. We, lost, we sure. lost, I think, in the quarters the first year, and she was very disappointed. And, uh, you know, to have won, um, finally, I think that made her extremely happy. Um, you know, it meant a lot to her as well. And, uh, but most of all, I know she wanted me to win and experience the win. And, and I was happy to say that, that I did. So it, it, it all was, uh, uh, great and most memorable 
to me, for sure. Most memorable. It's incredible. That is so incredible. And so few people experience that. And you are a true champion, Rosie Cassells, a true well, champion. Thank you, you, you very amassed- much, Kim. I appreciate your, um, you know, doing what you do here and, you know, sharing all this with uh, tennis fans. Well, there she is, Rosie Casals. She's won 595 wins in singles, 508 wins in doubles. Uh, Rosie, thank you so much for your time and spending your time with us today. Please support her at Love Love Tennis Foundation and go see her at Indian Wells. It's, it's a moment you will never forget. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Bye. We'll talk to you soon. So there she is, the Wimbledon champion, Rosie Cassells herself. Philip, that was so fun to listen to for me. My, obviously, I mean, I already knew beforehand it was going to be my favorite and it did not disappoint. How cool is that to like listen to her story? Uh, Someone who's so important to our game and as a woman who's so important to not just women's tennis, but women's sports in general, because tennis is really the f- like at the forefront. They are the leaders in equality. Right, and I said it in the interview, and I really do believe that everyone who has come after Rosie uh, really owes her a debt of gratitude for their ability to have a career in women's tennis. I mean, if it wasn't for her and the 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 incredible women that she started the WTA with, it would not have happened. And I feel like her story gets lost and I'm just so proud to bring it to the forefront, especially knowing where she came from. I feel like oftentimes maybe she doesn't get reminded often of her own accolades. Mm -hmm. You know, she didn't even kind of remember some of the things that I shared (laughs) with her, which was just so beautiful how, humble she was about that and Mm -hmm. I feel like she really deserves to be lifted up for her game her fight uh, you know with her parents being immigrants and her just fighting for a place in this world in Northern California and then rising to the top of the tennis rankings incredible yeah I love the story about uh, the car that she was like going to the tennis tournaments. Right. Sometimes and they sometimes make they make it. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they had to get a ride. And sometimes, sometimes she got defaulted. Like sometimes she rode on the back of a motorcycle to yeah. get there. I mean, my goodness, that's so cool. Like, a, you know, that's what a colorful story. Like, a, I just really uh, appreciated those little nuances of like her life that you don't get on Wikipedia. Yeah. And you have to come to the event with me this year at Indian Wells. But Rosie... I looked up the website, <laughs> Love Love and Love Tennis. Love and Love Tennis Foundation, yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, I saw that it was like, oh, this is the invitation. I was like, oh, I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe that more people don't go to this because it's something that you can, you know, purchase a ticket for for the dinner and it's a fundraiser for the foundation, of course. But I mean, it is a who's who of everyone in tennis that is, they're already there at Indian Wells, but they all gather together in this room. I mean, I got my Billie Jean King selfie there. It was so yeah. amazing. And, and to sit with Chris Everett and to sit with Martina Navratilova and, you know, just be able to meet these people, <laughs> this is like you know, tennis dream, right? This is tennis yeah. heaven. And Mary Carrillo is doing the MC. Right. She was an MC. And then I learned these wonderful stories about them just kind of talking about how the camaraderie that they had and how they were played backgammon before finals of these yeah. major tournaments, you know, and, and how they're still friends today. Yeah. And they're very close and maybe even closer today. So really, really cool. I really hope that you guys will support uh, this incredible event that Rosie Casal does. Um, she has a couple of events coming up. You can find out all about it at lovelovetennisfoundation.com uh, to support her, to buy tickets, to join her at Indian Wells. And you can meet us there because I'm really hoping that we'll be able to go. I will be there from the 17th to the 19th. Very cool. Yeah, and we're gonna definitely going to do a report from Indian Wells like we did last year. That would be cool. And Nicholas will be there, I believe, as well. And I, and I think Fiona from Australia is trying to join us. Oh, gosh, that would be so cool. <laughs> Incredible, Come on, right? Fiona, let's get Tanya. Let's get everyone out. <laughs> Let's have like a reunion day. If they if we can't make that happen this year, then next year, we gotta maybe we it. could do like the tennis podcast and how they crowdfund their podcast. Oh, yeah. We could just crowdfund like 
a special Indian Wells episode. Right. Well, I just don't think people care enough about us. But. Look, if we could get like 100 people to give $10, <laughs> we could get one of them out here or at least pay for half their ticket. <laughs> well, I'll, I'm, I'll gladly pay for mine, but I would love to have people raise funds for some of these tennis reporters, especially that are out of the area yeah. in different countries to come to the United States. And, you know, well, think about like we have the best tournament. Yes. That's in so the true. on the tour, thank you, in Larry our backyard, Ellison. yeah, right, Larry, Larry Ellison. <laughs> thank you, is Oracle awesome. and UTR. <laughs> yes, so like we're so blessed. Like it's it could be easy for us to take it for granted. I've been going there for like sixteen years every year. Yeah, and you know because it's like an hour and a half drive for me. Yeah, and it's fine. Yeah, but like I don't have to go fly across the world to yeah. have that amazing experience. Well, that just makes me think we should just do a giveaway for one of these, you know, amazing tickets. So I'll talk to Rosie and see what I can do. That oh, would be nice. amazing, right? I mean. For one of our listeners. Depending so cool. on depending on what we wanted to do, there's there's uh, grandstand seating for 40 bucks. Yeah. It's not bad. I mean, I'll pitch that in for a listener <laughs> and I'll sit up there with them. I don't mind. It's the big, biggest tennis, second biggest tennis stadium in the world. Um, is yeah, it? it's only behind Arthur Ashe. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, so it's even bigger than like Australian Open, right. Wimbledon. Well, I guess Wimbledon's not really that big. Right. French Open, is, I don't believe, is very big either. But the Australian Open's pretty big. Mm. They're their main stadium. Um, oh, that reminds me that Roger Federer just broke that record, right? He got over 40,000 or was it 50,000 people to show up in Mexico in the for an exhibition for an exhibition nice yeah. and then they're, they're trying to do it with Roger and Rafa Nadal for the Roger Federer Foundation in South Africa this year so that's going to be they're trying to have over 50,000 people show up for the first time well just shave be, a little so bit of money off the tickets and you could <laughs> probably get 100,000 people there <laughs> So that'd be cool. I mean, he could fill a stadium with 35,000 people just to watch him practice. He really could. I mean, <laughs> he does it all the time, actually. <laughs> when we're at Indian Wells, there's like 10,000 people huddled together trying to get a glimpse at him. <laughs> yeah, he really does. And it's so worth it, too, Yeah, to be that close. It's kind of amazing. It's crazy to think that my first year, at, not that's not true. My first year seeing Roger at Indian Wells, it wasn't my first year there. There were no fences or barriers or anything. Wow. And I was just standing there taking pictures of him and Mirka on the court. Oh, my god! And, like, I could have just walked right on. And obviously now it's so popular we can't do that. But I love that I have the memory of just being, like, eight feet away it's from incredible. him with no barriers and no, like, hoopla around me. It was, wow. it was nice. And I feel like getting a picture of Mirka is even more <laughs> impressive because <laughs> she doesn't so go around anymore. She's huh? so elusive, you know, it's really. Oh, back then she just sat there through his whole practice. Yeah. I mean, that would be like the dream to get a Mirka Federer interview for Tennis Pal Chronicles. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> you know what I love about you? My forever optimist. Think big, think big. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's another manifestation. You just put it out in the world. That's you never right. know what's going to happen. You never know. But please join uh, Rosie Casals at her incredible event at Indian Wells. I think you're. it's going to blow your mind just like it blew mine, and you're going to meet some of the greatest tennis players of all time. And just to see their camaraderie and have them talking, I think it's just so amazing. So uh, support Love Love Tennis Foundation and all the great things that Rosie is doing in the Palm Desert area near Palm Springs, and she really works hard to support tennis and the juniors in her area. And she also does this really cool event at the Langham, where I work, called Billie Jean King and Friends, and uh, raises money also for the foundation there as well. And that is, the Langham is in Pasadena, correct? In Pasadena, yeah. And actually, earlier during the day, they do a kind of on-court um, meet-the-pros kind of teaching hour where you know, you can meet, uh, like Pam Shriver was there, Maria Carrillo was there, uh, Rosie was there, and also Richard Gonzalez, the son of Pancho Gonzalez, was there. So, And they're all working with, like, the Boys and Girls Club, and then they allow players from the L.A. area to come and meet them and play with them for an hour kind of thing. So it's, nice. it's all at Cal State Los Angeles, and it's really a cool event. So if you want to find out more about that, you can also go to Love Love Tennis Foundation, or you can uh, just email us pk at tennispal.com and i'll send you all the 411 and i'll definitely be there i'm there every year so 
would love to meet you there. All of the information will be on my website, uh, lovesetmatch.net. We'll get it up on tennispal.com as an event. And of course, on Rosie's site, Love Love Tennis Foundation. Nice. And I don't know, you know, for those of you who may be too far to join us at the event, you know, if you want to donate to a cause, like if you are like me and you were just like, Rosie Casals is amazing. She did so much for women's sports. Let's help her out. Uh, you can find out how to donate on her website, which Philip's going to hook you up with the links. She does a lot for, for like um, underprivileged kids, uh, people who would otherwise maybe never be introduced to tennis. Yeah, she really does. And I just feel so grateful that she spent time with us here at Tennis Pal Chronicles. So What? What? Like, amazing. So grateful. So thank you so much, Rosie Casals, for being my friend and being on our podcast. We love you, and we thank you so much for being here. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Philip, what's what can uh, our listeners look forward to? Oh, you know, uh, at the top of the podcast, we talked about the exhibition that's happening, raising funds for the Australian fires relief and what's happening over there. Have you seen the, the tweets of like the air quality? It's just incredibly bad. Kind of amazing what's happening over there. Uh, massive fires. So they are doing an exhibition and Roger, Rafa and Serena are all headlighting that exhibition. And uh, one of our fan favorite reporters, Martina, is actually going to go and record her experience at the exhibition. So we'll get that up as soon as I receive that information from her. And uh, we're excited to bring our listeners via podcast to that experience and hopefully help them feel like they're right there in a seat next to Martina. That would be so cool. I can't wait. Yeah, that's going to be good. And I really am looking forward to our discussion about uh, veganism, vegetarianism, and what that means to health and playing tennis. And hopefully we can learn a lot about how diet impacts our ability to achieve in sports. Yeah, it will be. uh, It's always a fun debate or not that we're going to debate and not Anybody can debate with us, but it's always a fun conversation to have. I think Um, like most tennis players, we just want to learn how to achieve optimal performance. And so what are some of the options? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, don't take Roger Federer's advice, eating a bunch of pasta before your match, (laughs) chocolate after, and And wine. (laughs) Yeah, chocolate ice cream and wine. We're not all as blessed as Roger Federer. Everyone else has to work really hard for what they got. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I know for me, just on the local courts, I really want to be able to compete to the best of my own ability. So I know that diet makes a big difference uh, in that, as well as just in longevity and in health. So look forward to that podcast as well. Sounds good. Well, thanks for listening, guys. We really appreciate it. We thank you, Tennis Pal, for sponsoring us and for allowing this podcast to happen. Please download the app TennisPal.com is where you can find out more information. And you can also find a coach and get coaching virtually as well from Tennis Pal Coach. And that's a separate app. Oh, Philip, I did not. You were flowing. I thought you were going to stop. I needed to tell you. Tell me. The listeners need to know this. This is really important. <laughs> Number one I priority. I think this is the first damn time I ever saw you in my life, and you don't have anything Roger Federer on. <laughs> you were wearing some wreck tennis hat <laughs> and some Honda t-shirt. <laughs> like it's for the marathon. Like biking. Oh, a marathon? Okay. Yeah, LA Marathon. I'm probably. like, uh, where's the where's the Roger love? I've, I have known you a long time, and I've seen you a million times, and I've never seen seen you without a Roger hat or shirt. Well, I'll tell you, I just came from coaching at the Langham, and I prefer this hat when I'm playing tennis because do you see how, many, how perforated it oh, is? Yeah. It really breathes super well, yeah. and it's very, very light. So it does the sun job, but it also uh, doesn't create as, as much sweat as a normal baseball cap would. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, most of the merch that you buy that's branded isn't like high performance wear, yeah. you know. Although Nadal's hats, his Nike dry fit yeah. hats, I have, I've had a couple. Mm. Those are good. Mm, yeah. Uh, really breathable and airy and great material. But Roger's hats tend to be not the greatest for playing in. They're more for style. Well, well especially I mean, for me. Yeah. I mean, I know he does have some dry fit hats, but I think right now there's a flux of what's going to happen 
with Roger's merch. Oh, and yeah. actually, the rumor is that in March, he's supposed to get his RF back. What? Yeah. Don't you dare play with my emotions, <laughs> Philip. Oh, my God. I'm going to go broke in March. Because you know what? If he gets back in March in time for Indian Wells, I'll be <laughs> at that merchandise buy out that store. <laughs> buy out Tennis Warehouse. Like when I went to the U.S. Open in 2009. Yeah. I literally bought one of every single Roger thing. Oh, wow. I spent like six hundred dollars oh, wow. just in merch the first you're, day I was there. Gosh, you're such a great fan. That's awesome. Well, you know, I have problems, but <laughs> it's okay. People tend to deal with them. So set me for yeah. my obsessions. <laughs> well, he actually said it himself in a press release uh, last year. So he said February, March. Oh. Uh, well, that's is what amazing. he's hoping. So we'll see what happens with you know his brand in Uniqlo and um, and yeah, obviously Rafa hats will be there as well. So maybe Nicholas can buy us one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> well, thanks for listening, guys. We really appreciate you listening to this podcast. We hope you have fun, and especially would you spread the word that this Rosie Casals interview exists because I feel like so many people need to be reminded of her greatness. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful podcast for them to listen to and hear her story from her own words. Yeah, yeah. for sure. We'll catch you next time. Thank you. Hey. Hey. What do you want all your serves to be? I, You know, it would be awesome if all my serves were <laughs> aces. aces. Bye. <laughs>